What's up, YouTube uh, and whoever? Um, doing another reaction video. This one is from the Royal Institute. John Gribben. Uh, title is The Search for the Theory of Everything. That's uh, just like a lecture. And I've watched several Royal Institute videos. Uh, they're very good. Uh, a lot of times I disagree with what they say. This one obviously appealed to me because of my own research, which is the theory of everything, in my opinion. <laughs> Long story short, let's play the video. <laughs> Some of you may want to get up and leave when I tell you this is not about the theory of everything. Uh, that's the subtitle. It's about um, why we don't necessarily need to worry about a theory of everything uh, because the combination or separate pieces of quantum theory and the general theory combine to tell us that there's something really fundamentally true and accurate uh, about our understanding of science. And the book is in... No, 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 nine, yet, um, no, <laughs> can't just say that we don't need a theory of everything because what we have is good enough. For those who don't know, a theory of everything is not just like a, it's not, it's, it's a actual tangible meaning. It is the term of assigned to the theory in physics that describes how everything functions from its most fundamental level, most basic and fundamental level that unites everything in physics. That's what the theory of everything is. Now, it also when it is found applies to everything because it connects to everything but that's besides the point what he's suggesting is that quantum mechanics is true false it is an approximation built on a minuscule aspect of all that is which is the small that we observe in observations that we feel in developing quantum mechanics are the ones that are most important. Why? Because they're the small. Small is smaller. <clears throat> small is smaller than big. And by being smaller than big, it is what big is composed of. And because big is composed of small, small is more fundamental, therefore quantum mechanics, basically. The reality is, is that the universe is infinite, and so even if we say something is small, it's still large relative to other things. And those things are large relative to other things. And things that we see as big are small relative to other things. And essentially all things are equal. There is no like more fundamental particle than some other fundamental particle or than some other particle. There's no elementary particle. There's no bottom as quantum mechanics essentially assumes. It is an approximation that fits within the confines of the observations that we limit ourselves to in making the conclusions that we make about reality. And then we say, oh, well, it fits. See, it fits. Because it fits, it explains everything. Even though it doesn't explain what we see right in front of our eyes. Anyway, before I go ranting for too long, I'm sure I'm going to have many reactions to this video already because wrong. <laughs> and this is common in physics to basically be like, you know what? We don't need a better model because our model is already awesome. And by better, I mean a more accurate model, not better, just a more precise a more fine-tuned no 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 it's fine-tuned enough we've got it except we just need to like tweak the knobs a little bit no 
the models that we put forth right now that are held in esteem as the absolutes are all fundamentally, unequivocally, complete, false. Nothing is correct about them. And the reason that is is because they're approximations. They may hold true within the confines of a certain range of observations, but they don't explain everything. And because they don't explain everything, they only apply to the tiny amount of infinity, zero, like essentially 0% of all it is, they are false. Two parts. The first part is about stars and how we know the ages of stars. And the second part is about the universe and how we know the age of the universe. I can't cover all of that here, so I'm going to very, very quickly skip through. Well, in that case... We don't know the age of the universe because we claim it to be 13.8 billion years, which is bullshit. It's not 13.8 billion years old. That's ridiculous. I mean, next to infinity, you might as well say it's 6,000 years old. I mean, for all the hate of Christians that happens in the scientific community, it's the same damn thing. 13.8 billion years? That's nothing. Oh, it's so long. No, it's nothing some of the stars story and then concentrate on the universe story um, so this is where we live talking about the universe and to put that in immediate perspective um, you can compare it with the size of the sun I and in round numbers about 100 earths would stretch across the diameter of the sun and as everybody knows volume goes as a cube so that means the size of the sun in terms of volume is a million and a bit times the size of the earth and the sun is a very ordinary boring star uh, with nothing special about it except that it's our local neighborhood star i'm sure you know all that already but the story of how we know about stars in general and the ages of stars starts with the sun and it starts with this which is a spectrum of the sun and the pretty rainbow colors uh, and across the rainbow colors you get these dark stripes which are caused by atoms in the atmosphere of the sun absorbing light coming out to us and these are distinctive you know fingerprints or barcodes or whatever you want to call them which tell us what the sun is made of so you can work out the composition of the sun from this evidence and something that I think people may not appreciate is how recently we've started to know these things. It was the end of the 1920s, much less than 100 years ago, that people started to be able to use this evidence to work out the composition of the sun. And even then, as I explain in the book, it took them a good bit longer uh, to, to get the, the numbers exactly right. The other thing that's important about the sun's spectrum, sunlight, is that it uh, follows very nearly what's called a black body curve, which is the pattern of radiation from uh, what's known as a perfect radiator. And it may seem strange that a perfect radiator of energy is a black body, but it gets the name because an object that is perfectly absorbing and absorbs all the electromagnetic radiation that falls on it, if it's hot enough, it will then radiate all the radiation out uh, in this characteristic sweeping curve, which is the black body curve. And the peak in the curve uh, tells you the temperature of what's doing the radiating. In this case, it says 5,000 K. I think it's a little low um, for the sun, this diagram. But what matters and comes into the story later on is that if you can measure this curve and you can measure where the peak is, then you know the temperature of the radiation that's involved. This tells us how hot the surface of the sun is, and you can even use it to uh, work out how hot the temperature of the surface of other stars are. And if you know how hot stars are and you know their masses, which is easy for the sun because it's worked out from the way the planets orbit around it, and it turns out to be quite easy for some stars because they're in binary pairs and the gravitational influence of one star on the other tells you how fast they're going round and you can work out the masses from that. Then you can put all that together and you can work out how hot they are inside. Now this is something that was again only done in the 1920s-ish sort of time and just at that time people were starting to develop an understanding of how atoms and nuclei interact and it was appreciated that the only way stars could be kept hot was by nuclear fusion, essentially by sticking hydrogen and nuclei together to make helium. And the basic laws of physics pre-quantum physics said that the temperature in the middle of a star like the sun, which is about 15 million degrees, was not enough to allow these things to stick together. Because what happens is you have hydrogen <coughs> nuclei, protons, both positively charged, they charge towards one another, the electric repulsion pushes them apart before they can actually collide and fuse to make something else. 
And what happened was that um, as quantum physics was developed, it was appreciated that there is a purely quantum phenomenon which allows this fusion to happen at the temperature at the heart of the sun. And it's to do with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and the idea of part. What the actual fuck? No. <laughs> Not saying I know everything. But when it comes to the temperature inside of a star and claiming that that's coming from nuclear fusion, that is not an absolute. Now we think that the only way a star can exist as it is and continue to be fueled is for nuclear fusion to occur. But that is, in essence, uh, assuming the, the major assumption happening is that there is no input into the system. It is as it is, and all it can do is radiate. It's never going to have an input. The reality is, is that there is infinite layers of particles that are smaller and smaller, and those enter into the system and merge to become larger particles which then become part of the system in a very real way causing heat to radiate and radiation to come off the system it's got nothing to do with the collision of of particles creating higher uh, atomic mass systems what else was he talking about Um, as quantum physics was developed, it oh, was yeah. No, you can't just be like quantum because quantum mechanics. I hear this thing, the uh, where physics will say, a physicist will say, the electron follows the equations of quantum mechanics. So, like the electron behaves according to that which is preset in it, which is the equations of quantum mechanics. No. Just no. There's so many fun things wrong with the that way of looking at things. <laughs> to say that it's some, a system obeys some equation within some theoretical model that isn't factual. But to claim it as if it's some like... I don't even, I don't know. It was appreciated that there is a purely quantum phenomenon which allows this fusion to happen at the temperature mm -hmm. at the heart of the sun. And it's to do really? with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and the idea of particles being not pure particles but also waves. And one way to think about this is that instead of your two little hard particles charging towards each other and not quite touching, they're actually sort of waves. And that once they get that close, they can hug each other. Okay. But the important thing is that it's purely quantum physics that allows this to happen. And I, I won't bother going into great details about this, but this uh, no. is called the proton-proton chain. It's one way that you can stick... Uh, Just stop claiming that quantum mechanics is some underlying thing causing other things that we see. I mean, they're trying to work their way into the function of a star. <laughs> oh, we have this problem with the function of the star. Our ridiculous model is not arriving at an explanation for this thing. Oh, you don't have an explanation for this thing? Hmm. I wonder if quantum mechanics can come up with an explanation for this thing. When the whole thing is fucking ridiculous and wrong. So you can't come up with an ex explanation for some bullshit using some other bullshit and be like, oh, now that we have an explanation, so that therefore verifies the first bullshit and the second bullshit. Voila. Nine. Um, hydrogen nuclei together to make helium. And there's another way, which is important in stars that are a bit bigger than the sun, uh, which is called the carbon cycle or carbon nitrogen cycle. Uh, and it, it goes round and round in a loop, and if you give you a couple of minutes to study the loop, you'll see wherever you start, you go round the loop, and what's happened in effect is you've taken four protons, four hydrogen nuclei, and turned them into one helium nucleus, and then you've got back to where you started, and so it keeps going round and round all the time. But the 
really, really important single thing to take away from all this is that this only happens because of quantum effects, because of tunneling, as it's called. Now, there's something else that is purely a quantum effect, and that comes into the age of the stars, and that's uh, the process of radioactive decay, which I'm sure everyone's heard about, um, the, the idea of half-life. If you've got a, a, a sample of a radioactive material, in a certain amount of time, half of it will decay into something else. And then in the next interval the same size, another half, which is a quarter of the original, will decay, and so on. And some things decay in a fraction of a second, some take thousands of years. There's so many assumptions going on with radioactive decay half-life rates and using them as measures of absolute time. They assume that the decay rate has not changed. Why? How, how do we know? How can we possibly know that when we don't even know how physics functions? That is such a huge assumption. Now, decay is related to the environment regardless of what studies we've claimed to have verified otherwise. The environment plays a role in whether or not something is decaying at the rate that we are observing. And so if it goes through a drastic environment change, one that we're not aware of, and then we calculate some age, unaware of the change in half-lives then we're just gonna be like oh this it's this age that we've concluded because we know that half-lives blah 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 radiometric dating is reliable no can't claim radio radiometric dating is reliable when we don't have an actual model in physics that is true not just some theory, but is absolutely true. Everything we say is theory. No. Basing our interpretation of radiometric dating and its answer and its solutions, what we observe on a theory is not sound. <clears throat> this is just wanting to find answers when we don't actually have what we need to begin with. And so we just basically make things up because we don't have the answers. Some take millions of years. And some of the ones that take millions more. of years uh, to decay are seen in some very old stars. And because you can measure the proportions of the different things that it decays into, you can work out how long the decay has been going on. I mean, this is ridiculous to think that across the universe the decay rate is exactly identical to that which we see in a, in a laboratory setting on Earth when we don't even understand what decay is besides what that we name it that and we see observations of how it generally functions. We don't know what it is. <sighs> and by generally, I mean generally. <laughs> on. And this is what tells us, at the end of my brief introduction to stars, this is the end of part one of my book, uh, the oldest star that we know of, the, the best oldest star, has an age of 13.2 billion years. Best. There are other stars with similar sorts of ages and much more uncertainty in the measurements because it's obviously quite difficult to measure the abundance of... Sounds like he's suggesting other stars that may appear to have ages greater than 13.8 billion years and we can't have that they must be wrong <laughs> there's got to be something wrong here uranium and thorium and things like that in a star that's uh, hundreds of light years away can be done using spectroscopy back to the beginning but the really solid time that is the 13.2 billion years so to keep that one in particular in your head while i tell you about the age of the universe Okay, well, our home in space, um, the, our local neighbourhood, I showed you the sun, uh, this is a, a galaxy very much like our Milky Way, as it would look from outside, and this is typical of the components of the universe. Uh, there are 
hundreds of billions of galaxies like this scattered across space, and it's the way these galaxies behave and how they seem to be um, related to one another and how they are separating from one another. I, I don't need to tell you the universe is expanding, I'm sure, I'm not giving too much away, uh, is what tells us the age. But this is, this is the sort of thing, this is the smallest thing that cosmologists are interested in. Okay, and uh, I... I don't know how much he's going to talk about that. Can't hear him talking shit. One second. Um, all right, so um, I don't know how much he's going to talk about that. So I just want to say uh, in terms of expansion of space. Uh, is what tells us the age. But this is, this is the sort of thing, this is the smallest thing that cosmologists are interested in. This, this, is, this video is very much like, um, to me, I see like an indoctrination into a way of thinking that's just assumed. There's so many assumptions, just like, yes, we know this is true, yes, yes. Yes, for sure this is true. And it's not. None of it's true. <laughs> we all know about the, the space is expanding, that these things are moving away from each other. No. What we actually know is that there are redshift values in these galaxies. We interpret all these other things that we think that we know, but that's not right. That's the, that's the truth. What's not really spoken in these things is that there is this interpretation step prior to us actually arriving at what we're saying at. And so what we're saying is the interpretation, not the observation. And because it's based on an observation, we're saying, oh, well, we observe this as if it's some truth when the reality is what is actually known is that these galaxies are redshifted, not that there's anything to do with these galaxies moving apart from each other and expanding into nothingness and blah, blah, blah. No, all of that is interpretation. That is, the way he says it though, is as if it's known. We all know to one another and how they are separating from one another. I, I don't need to tell you the universe is expanding. I'm sure I'm not giving too much away is expanding. I'm sure I'm not giving too much away. No, it's not. As a matter of fact, it's not. It's red shifted and nothing more. Interpretation is that it's expanding, sure. Uh, is what tells us the age. But this is, this is the sort of thing, this is the smallest thing that cosmologists are interested in. Okay, and uh, I was very nearly a cosmologist. In fact, I was advised not to be. I, when I was an undergraduate, I um, had the opportunity to meet Herman Bondi, who, who, who was one of the progenitors of the steady state theory of cosmology. Uh, and I was wondering what to do after I finished my degree. And I went to see him and I said, I'm really interested in cosmology, Professor Bondi. You know, how do I get into it? And he advised me that I should do something sensible first. Uh, so I did. And I never did get to be a cosmologist. I'm never sure if that was good advice or not. Not. I've done, I've done okay, but cosmology got much more exciting a few years after he told me that. Anyway, and this is um, Top Edge On, uh, and uh, the dark line through there is sort of dust and stuff, and uh, oh, I didn't sort of tell you this, the, the sun is sort of two-thirds of the way out towards the edge of a galaxy like that in a particularly unspectacular, um, ordinary region, uh, and in the plane where you see that dust, that's where in relatively interesting things happen yeah. because that is largely made of debris from old stars that have run through their life cycles and exploded and spewed out material into space and then that has made dust and new stars and planets and at least on one planet. So many assumptions. <sighs> is that how planets are made? Like across the levels of the infinite levels of the universe, all things function the same. If we're not drawing parallels, then we're just m we're missing the mark. Planet people, and that is, we all know. We're to say that stars are just exploding, creating this dust, is completely disregarding the significance of the central object around which it's all orbiting. Which only would make sense if just like a 
the rings of Saturn. We don't say the rings of Saturn are formed by the exploding of the particles within the rings of Saturn. We say Saturn is why there's rings of Saturn. Whereas in this case, he's saying, oh, well, this ring, this disk structure is caused by the exploding of the stars. I mean, this is common in physics to, to associate things with what we see and not with the overwhelmingly present objects at the center of the freaking galaxy and recognizing the parallels between other objects in the cosmos just because we call something a planet and something else a galaxy doesn't mean there's actually any difference between the two we're the ones drawing the line between how they function you're all made of stardust except for the old bit of hydrogen in your body so, how do we know about galaxies and what they're doing and so on? We know the distances to galaxies because they contain these stars which um, are vary in a very regular fashion, which are called Cepheid variables. And they have different um, periods, the gap between the, the peaks in the periodicity, depending on how bright they are. And this enables you to work out their distances. And again, this is something that wasn't known about until, in this case, just over uh, 100 years ago. I think it was about 1912. Um, but the, the Henrietta Swan, who's pictured here, um, she discovered Cepheids uh, in uh, all more or less at the same distance from us, which is the key. It's no good knowing that their brightness is related to their period if you don't know how far away they are to, to sort of calibrate things and start things off. And the Milky Way galaxy that I showed you has some companions around it. And these companions, the two biggest ones, are called the small and large Magellanic clouds because uh, Magellan spotted them when he was uh, sailing south of the equator and no European had seen them before. A few people had seen them before, but they didn't count as far as naming was concerned. Um, and they're so far away from us that for all practical purposes, all the stars in them are at the same distance. You know, even from one side of the cloud of stars to the other is a small fraction of the total distance. So Henrietta Swan noticed while she was doing a very boring cataloging job of sort of counting stars and measuring their brightnesses and looking for periods and so on, she realized that these stars were all essentially at the same distance. And then she spotted that the brighter Cepheids uh, had a different periodicity from the dimmer Cepheids. And this is actually her data printed up. It's a modern plot. But these are actually her numbers. So you can see that, that the, how many days a star of a particular brightness um, takes for its oscillation up and down. And so then all you have to do, if you can find the Cepheid, is to measure its uh, period. And then that tells you how bright it really is. And then you measure its actual brightness seen from Earth, or its dimness, if you want to think of it that way, and that tells you how far away it is. So if you've got a 100 watt light bulb, you know, at the end of the street, you could measure the output reaching your, your photo multiplier and work out the length of the street. So it, it's a very simple technique in principle. It's made much harder by boring things like there being dust in space. So some of the light might get blocked out by dust, and that gives you a false reading. And so you need more and more and more of these things to try and get accurate measurements. And that's one of the reasons why it took a long time to pin down crucial distances to galaxies and, uh, and things like that. Um, and this has been superseded and brought up to date by uh, a satellite which operated a few years ago called Hipparchos, which measured millions of, of stars and calibrated the, this relationship very, very accurately and really pinned down what we know about the relationship between the period and luminosity, the Cepheid, so you could measure distances. But this is the first step so everything else measuring out across the universe depends on knowing this okay there's no other way of getting out from our galaxy to other galaxies reliably to set things off so you have you kind of like an inverted pyramid you know you look at modern measurements of things you know and they're measuring all kinds of clever stuff and supernovae and things like that i'm sure you've heard of um but that all depends on calibrating things using using this stuff so uh, thank, thanks to henrietta swan that we, we know what's going on so People didn't know that um, galaxies, which were called nebulae at first, didn't know for sure that they were something outside our galaxy, that they were other galaxies like our own, until the late 1920s. This is a nice... I like how he's focusing on the history of it all. This is true, and it's important. We can't just 
hear the models without going through the history of the observations and why we're thinking the things we're thinking and the step of going outside of the galaxy of the Milky Way to recognizing there are these other systems is vitally important in terms of why we began to be believe the Big Bang happened. There has been a debate about it, there has been speculation, but there was no proof until a guy called Edwin Hubble uh, took this photograph of our relatively near neighbour, the Andromeda Galaxy, which was called the Andromeda Nebula in those days. Um, and it's a negative because uh, astronomers in the days when you worked with, with actual photographic plates, big glass plates, uh, preferred black on white because it's easier to pick out individual stars in that way. And uh, he got very excited when he saw this and uh, wrote up there. Initially, he put N uh, because he thought he'd seen a nova, N for nova, a, a bright star that flares up. And then he took a picture a few days later, and it was a different brightness, and then it came back again. So he crossed out the N and wrote VAR, exclamation mark, variable. So that was, um, I think it was October, probably stood up there, October 1923. And over the course of the winter, he measured the regular variations in brightness of this star. He discovered it was a Cepheid. He knew its periods because he'd measured it. He knew its brightness because Henrietta Swan had worked out what brightness a Cepheid with that period must have. So he knew the distance to the whole Andromeda Nebula, which turned out to be a galaxy beyond the Milky Way, another galaxy uh, in its own right, just as big, in fact, slightly bigger than ours hundreds of billions of stars forming what became known as an island in space. So that was the first stepping stone out into space beyond the Milky Way, and as I say, depending entirely on the Cepheid measurement. Now, when Hubble measured this, so in the mid-1920s, there had been some measurements made by a guy called Vesto Sliffer, and he'd measured nebulae not knowing what they were, but he'd measured the overall light from them, and he'd discovered that they have, uh, typically, that the light is shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. You can tell this, if you remember back to the beginning, the spectral lines that tell you what the sun's made of, they're at precise wavelengths. And he found that most of the nebulae he could measure, which was a dozen, twenty, sort of things like that with the telescope he had, they were shifted towards the red. A couple were shifted towards the blue, in particular Andromeda. And the simple explanation of this was that it's a Doppler effect caused by things moving through space. And so the Andromeda Nebula <coughs> moving towards us, most of the others One moving of. away from us. Uh, it's not a Doppler effect. I'll, I'll tell you about that later on. Um, One of the simple explanations for this is Doppler effect. So he's talking about red shifts and blue shifts and how the Andromeda is blue shifted. And... Uh, the reason he's saying the simple explanation for this is Doppler effect is because that's what they went to. It's not just uh, the, that's the simple explanation, but that's actually what they concluded when they observed these things is this was Doppler effect. Now, Doppler effect is not the only cause of redshift. There's also a gravitational redshift. And as he's saying, it's not Doppler effect. So what is it comes into literally just making some shit up and having it effectively be Doppler effect, but in a way where the motions are not breaking the laws of physics by tr the galaxies traveling faster than the speed of light in the interpretation of Doppler effect. But there was already this idea that most nebulae seemed to be moving away from us, most that he could measure with the telescope at his disposal. And Hubble was very interested in using this uh, as a tool to work out distances, because there was a hint that fainter nebulae had a bigger redshift, and fainter ones, guessing, meant they're further away, logical guess. So Hubble wanted to work out a way to measure distances. He didn't care about the redshifts and velocities or any of that stuff. He just wanted to know uh, how far away galaxies were and measure the universe, as, as he, he would have put it. So to do that, he needed somebody to help him, and he needed the best telescope available, and luckily he had that. He was working with the 100-inch telescope, which was the best one available at the time. Um, but it was too much work for one man, so he got this guy to come in um, and help him uh, to, to uh, measure the redshifts. Uh, and while he measured the redshifts, uh, Hubble himself m measured the distances using initially Cepheids and then calibrating other things. Like it, using Cepheids, he could work out that certain other things in galaxies were all roughly the same brightness, and some of those things were brighter than Cepheids, so he could apply them to galaxies further away where you couldn't see Cepheids. And it's a bit rough and ready, you know, but uh, it worked, and he began to measure distances, put them together with Humison's redshifts, 
And by the end of the 1920s, they had enough evidence. Also, though Hubble was a great self-publicist and, and he liked to take the credit for everything, um, he didn't bother mentioning that he used in his first publications on what became known as the redshift distance relation, a lot of Sliffer's work. He just didn't bother acknowledging Sliffer. But putting some of Sliffer's work together with his work and uh, Humerson's work, he had this relationship between what he called velocity and distance. And it's, you know, it's an optimistic kind of straight line through some fairly dodgy data, but it does go up at one end and down at the other, which is about all you could say in those days. So this led to the whole idea that the universe was expanding and popularized the idea that it kind of straight. This is the reality, is that there is distance and then redshift. And as Hubble did, he immediately interpreted that redshift into Doppler Doppler shift and translated it into velocity using Doppler shift. So redshift translated into velocity using Doppler shift. And so we literally started graphing it as if that was so, even though that's purely his interpretation. The true graph here is redshift versus distance. It is not velocity versus distance. This is an interpretation that immediately found its way into the almost the the f first in, uh, observation in all of the Big Bang model, where immediately interpretation is at the foundation of everything. Line through some fairly dodgy data, but it does go up at one end and down at the other, which is about all you could say in those days. So this led to the whole idea that the universe was expanding and popularized the idea that galaxies are moving apart from one another. But he'd been preempted in two ways. First of all, in the beginning of the 1920s, a Russian guy called Alex. I don't know if he's going to elaborate on that. This did not lead to the idea that the universe is expanding. What this led to is us thinking that galaxies were all moving apart from each other, not expanding as a co according to what we co call expansion of space. That did not come into the picture until we needed an explanation for why redshift values were so high. At some point, they were so high that those galaxies would be moving faster than the speed of light. And so it was necessitated that we have some other explanation that is more complex than the basic motion explanation of Doppler shift or a completely new explanation that uses some other mechanism entirely. And so then other than motion. And so to maintain the motion interpretation, expansion of space was just thrown in there and literally made up. So they're like, oh, something's causing everything to move away. It's not its actual motion, but it must therefore be the space between us and that object is getting larger. And so we see a, an, a redshift value that appears as if it's Doppler shift, but really what's happening is space is expanding. And they're just making shit up. I mean, flat out. That is literally just made up. The only basis for the concept at all is redshift. And the only basis for the concept within redshift is to interpret it as being the result of motion so it's already on the back of an interpretation and then another interpretation comes in and then they just make some shit up i mean that's not science this is bullshit is what it is <laughs> it's just guessing game where that has become popularized and held on to for some some reason Alexander friedman had been playing with the equations of the general theory of relativity, and he had found that the descriptions of the equa equations described a variety of possible universes. They allowed for the possibility that space itself was expanding or contracting or going up and down or coming down and up. And he published this as a really a mathematical curiosity. He wasn't seriously suggesting it applied to the real universe that we live in. Um, but he was the first person really to, to use the general theory 
in the way that cosmologists then did later on. Um, he died young, so, so he wasn't able to develop the idea. The, um, the official story is he died of typhoid uh, in an outbreak in, I don't know, early 1920s. Um, a guy called George Gamow, who we, we meet later, who was one of his students, always said that he died because he'd gone on a high-altitude balloon flight for meteorological observations and caught a chill and died as a result of that, which is, a, in a sense, a more romantic story. Um, but George Gamow was always entertaining, but uh, almost always unreliable. So <laughs> believe whichever version you like. But partly because Friedman wasn't on the scene, uh, somebody else came along before Hubble and Humerson had published their results, and using Sliffer's data uh, in particular, um, this guy, George Lemaitre, had solved the same equations that Friedman had solved entirely independently. He didn't know about Friedman's work, which had been published in uh, Russian journals. And he also found this family of relationships about expanding and contracting universes and so on. But the crucial difference is that Lemaitre said that this could explain what our actual universe is like, because there is the relationship Thanks. between redshift and distance, which says that galaxies further apart are moving away from us faster, and that fitted no. one of the possible... Uh, galaxies further away are redshifted more. Not moving away from us faster or anything about motion. That's pure speculation. Um, solutions to Einstein's equations. So he, he thought this out. He had the redshift distance law that I just showed you that uh, Hubble and Humison had got, um, essentially exactly the same law, although he had slightly less data to work on. And he published it, all before they published any of their stuff. But he made one crucial mistake. He's Belgian, and he published it. No, that's, that's not entirely the mistake. <laughs> And he published it in a, a French-language Belgian journal, which nobody read, or no cosmologist read anyway. So a year or two later, Hubble and Humerson come along, and Humerson's a nice, quiet, self-effacing guy who gets on with the work, but Hubble goes around saying, I am the great Hubble, and I've discovered this. And the Nature got a bit niffed about it, and uh, complained in particular to um, Arthur Eddington, who's the, the top um, British astronomer at the time, and famously one of the few people who was alleged to understand Einstein's theory, although really there were quite a few. And Eddington then... Um, got the paper published in English, and it was generally acknowledged in the trade uh, that Lemaitre deserves at least equal credit. Um, but uh, he, he still doesn't really get equal credit, except in my book. Um, and, and he also, I mean, as you can see from the picture, interestingly, he was a, a priest, a, a Roman Catholic priest, as well as being a cosmologist. So what he did was to think in terms of the physics of what was going on and what this implied for the universe in a real physical sense. As I say, Hubble didn't care. He never said what the redshift implied, whether it was a Doppler effect, whatever it was, um, but he just wanted to measure distances. It was Lemaitre who said, well, if you take this at face value, what's happening is that the space between galaxies is stretching. Space is expanding. It's not because things are moving through space. And then if you imagine going back, winding the movie backwards, what you say is that long ago, everything must have been in one place which he called um, the prim primal atom, which is a, a bit sloppy because it should have been primal nucleus. Um, but what he realized, and this shows you how empty space is, was that if you took everything that could be seen in those days, all the galaxies, as far as the best telescopes could see, and you wound the stuff back to the earliest possible time, that there would be a time when everything was the density of an atomic nucleus, not an atom, and would occupy a volume not much bigger than the sun, certainly no, not as big as the solar system. Now, that gives you an idea of the emptiness of space, and indeed the emptiness of atoms, because nucleus is a tiny part of an atom. So this was at the time when people were developing ideas about radioactivity, nuclear fission, and so on, working towards what became the you know, atomic bomb and all that sort of stuff. And so he had this sort of idea that there's this primal nucleus, which would be in some sense like a radioactive atom, and would spontaneously decay, split, fall apart, and the bits would fly apart because space was expanding and would gradually turn into stars and galaxies and all that stuff, which wasn't a completely bonkers idea by any means in, in the beginning of the 1930s. And he developed this idea and it culminated in a book that was published in 1946, which was just at the time when um, it was ready to be picked up by other people. And the story starts to come uh, a bit more up to date. So now the story splits in two, and I'll have to tell you one bit and then backtrack and 
go up the other branch to tell you what's going on. There's observation and theory. And this, of course, is what always happens in astronomy um, and in other aspects of science. You do observations or experiments and you develop better hypotheses and theories and then that tells you another experiment to do or another observation to make and you know it goes along like that and it's gradually builds up and up and up until you have a, a nice picture of something. So, observation. Well, sometimes we kind of get ahead of ourselves and take something as true and then don't really reanalyze it, hold it as some like cornerstone and just keep going and chugging along and then at some point all of this weight just builds up on top of this false assumption where it breaks down and that's what's happening in standard models in physics is there's just more and more observation that's just constantly happening across time and it's making it harder and harder for the models that we hold as true to be held as true because they have to somehow incorporate at least to some semblance of a degree all of these new things and one of the ways we get around that is by having several different models that are basically explain different areas so oh that observation that's for the big bang this one over here that's for quantum mechanics this one that's for relativity so because we have three models it gives us a, a much uh makes it much easier for each on each one to be maintained for a time but sooner or later they're going to start falling and when they start falling which they already really have it's just on a global scale where it's just understood that these are not true when that happens uh, it will be because there's more and more observations that disprove them which is constantly happening. There's all sorts of observations that are anomalous. I mean, we can throw labels at it like anomalous and mysterious or whatever and give it like random names and say we don't understand it and that's okay because we're trying to figure it out and just keep doing that. But sooner or later, it's gonna build up and it's gonna fall down. The person who took up the, the threads of, of what people like Hubble have been doing uh, and tried to get rid of all the uncertainties in this redshift distance relation and measure the redshift and measure the distances and use various kinds of, of these what are called proxy indicators like the brightest cluster in a galaxy and then the brightest galaxy in a group of galaxies and all kinds of things to get further and further out, measure more and more redshifts and really pin down this um, law which is still known as Hubble's law and it ought to be at the very least the Hubble the Met law um, but uh, this, this guy Alan Sandage gave his life his, his, his working life to doing this right through the 1950s and into the 1960s and he used the best telescope that there was it's ironic that a priest whose desire is to show that the universe had a beginning has become the dogma of science his theory <laughs> for the Hubble Space Telescope, which was a 200-inch telescope. Science being something that's like... just commonly against religion in general. To embrace it like that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, rather than be like, no, nah, we don't know. We just gotta jump on the first damn ban bandwagon that comes along scope in California, 200 inch diameter mirror. Um, and uh, and he, this was pushing the technology which gradually improved because you, you, you don't just look at photographs, you hang things on the end of the telescope that, that measure light in other ways. Uh, and so he was able slowly, slowly to pin down the actual value of the slope in this graph. And it's the value of that slope that I showed you that tells you how long it is since there was the primal atom or whatever it was that was there at the beginning by winding backwards. So he did. It's an assumption that the line is even a line. That this relationship of redshift per distance that we see is absolutely unequivocally a line. Why? Why? Well, the only reason we think it's acceptable as a line is because we think expansion of space is a thing. And so this line is caused by this thing called expansion of space. But the problem with that is that it's not a line. 
And then once we realize it's not a line, well, something's causing the expansion of space, this line, to become not a line. And the, the reason this line is not a line, but instead is a curve that curves upward, is because of this other thing called dark energy. And it is just unknown mystery. But the reality is we thought it was a line because we're wanting to maintain that we essentially have gotten there. And uh, that expansion of space is true, and so it's a line. And then at some point we figure out it's not a line, so we got to make up some more shit on just keep building it on top, putting more weight and more bullshit on top of the unsound foundation, which is bound to collapse. And sooner or later, see what happens. If it's sound, then it will ho hold for eternity, you know? <laughs> good, <laughs> good luck with that on that foundation. Did an enormous amount of work, and he pretty much got it right. But there was always a lot of uncertainty in his work. So he could tell you that the, what's known as the Hubble constant, which is the, the, the slope, in effect, of that graph, uh, was between 60 and 70. Okay, that, that's the sort of area between 60 and 75, maybe, which is phenomenal. You know, that, that I mean, to even say we don't know what the slope is, we kind of know, it again comes back to this original assumption that it even is a line. Why is it a line? explain why because you've decided it's a line this correlation of redshift per distance it is linear because we said so that's why there's no other reason why is it not exponential which is what it actually is no we assumed it to be linear because that's easy we can draw lines through things and make them look, oh, look at all these dots that we put a line through, and is, uh, there, therefore, the, there is this actual line, even though we just drew the damn thing. This linear relationship, even though we're just literally making this shit up. It's, it's kind of crazy how backward science is for being so forward-thinking in, in the way it portrays itself that we were even able to do that. I mean, that, people 100, 200 years ago would never have imagined that. And the way it works is, that is telling you how fast the universe is expanding. So the smaller that number is, the longer the time since the beginning, what you know, is going to be called the Big Bang, you know, about this time. Um, so if the universe is expanding very quickly, uh, then obviously it hasn't taken very long to get to where it is now. If it's expanding very slowly, it's taken much longer. And that is important because, uh, as the other half of my whole story concerns stars, even by the 1950s, people were able to measure the ages of stars reasonably accurately, not as accurately as we can. Also, there's some uncertainty in this that allows for if we see anything that sh suggests to us that the universe is older than we're uh, claiming it to be, then it must be within the uncertainty where the mistake lies. It's good for the Big Bang that there can be this range of doubt to allow it to persist to a degree. And today, and the number that you got out of Hubble's law, Lemaitre's law, it should be called, uh, was telling you at that time that the universe was younger than the stars, which is obviously nonsense, okay, crucially rubbish. So while Sandage was making measurements which gradually brought the value down, uh, which made the presumed age of the universe longer, um, there was room still for a big debate about whether there ever had been a beginning, whether there had been a primal atom. And that's where Herman Bondi, who I mentioned, and Fred Hoyle uh, and uh, other people um, came along and said, well, maybe there hadn't been a beginning. Maybe the universe had always been expanding and always looked much the same. And instead of one blob that had expanded, that as galaxies moved apart, new galaxies appeared in the gaps. And new galaxies would appear because... Occasionally, an atom of hydrogen, well, actually a neutron, which then decays into a proton and electron and becomes an atom of hydrogen, but essentially new atoms of hydrogen would appear in the gaps between galaxies. And as, as Hoyle always used to say, this is no more or less unlikely than all the hydrogen appearing in one go 
in a big bang, which is where the name came from. It's his, his turn. And he's quite right. As long as stars appeared to be older than the universe, this was a powerful argument that what's called the steady state model could be a viable alternative to what, thanks to Hoyle, became known as the big bang. Oh, but man, that was ruled out so um, because of what happened uh, later on. Yeah, and one of the things that happened much be, later uh, on was this a Hubble telescope named after Hubble himself. And it was um, named after him because the what was called the key project of the Hubble telescope was to measure distances to galaxies and redshifts, particularly using Cepheids, and to give a, a definitive once and for all answer to the question of how rapidly the universe is expanding, how big or how small Hubble's constant is, and therefore how old the universe is. So the reason why the earlier studies are given a value that was too big are related to the kinds of problems I mentioned when I talked about Henrietta Swan. The, the dust in between the stars pose problems calibrating the Cepheid right here uh, in our own Milky Way. And there's a problem because there's two kinds of stars which are very similar, and they're, they're called Cepheids and RR Lyrae variables, and ones, they've each got a, a, a relationship between brightness and period, but they're slightly different. And by bad luck, um, some of the ones that have been studied by the, the earlier people had been obscured by dust in just such a way that they looked like the other kind. And then when you looked at distant galaxies, you weren't looking through that dust, and so you got the wrong answer. So there were both kinds of problems, you know, which, which persisted, and they're the things that Sandage, more than anybody else, gradually eliminated one by one and found all, all the problems and so on. So this, this telescope was the culmination of that traditional method of measuring the Hubble constant, the metres per constant, the age of the universe, and so on. And to give you a feel, I wasn't any excuse to show these pictures, you know, Hubble, Hubble pictures, most of those things there are galaxies roughly comparable to our Milky Way, some bigger, some smaller, and so on. And this... Um, it's absolutely, that, that sort of patch of sky, you know, it looks fairly crowded. That's much more crowded. Every single fuzzy blob on that picture is a galaxy. Even more amazing, it's called the Hubble Deep Field. And it was found by choosing a part of the sky which looks completely black, where with ordinary telescopes you can see nothing at all. No galaxies, no stars, no nothing. And they pointed the Hubble telescope at it for a long time, hour after hour after hour. And what you can do then, this is a great thing about uh, technology, is, is if you look with your unaided eye, you go out in the dark and you look at the sky, after a few minutes your eye adapts and you see everything you're ever going to see. And you can sit there all night and you'll never see any difference. You'll see the stars going, you know, moving across the sky as the Earth rotates. But apart from that, you won't see anything that you couldn't see in the first half hour, say, because the eye is saturated. But if you've got photographic plates or today um, electronic charge couple devices, things like that, you can keep looking at the same place, and the individual photons come in, and each one is recorded, and it builds up, and builds up, and builds up. So the longer you look, the fainter the objects that you can see. So this region of the sky is particularly dark, away from any bright objects. It's also small. The area that's covered by the Hubble Deep Field, this is only part of it, sort of square bit, in, in, is the same size as if you had a drinking straw, an ordinary drinking straw, two metres long, and you held it up to your eye, and you looked at the sky. And that's what you see if you had eyes like CCDs. The universe is full of galaxies. And some of them are a very long way away. Uh, and in that sense, the light from them is very old. But in another sense, those galaxies are very young because we see them by light which left them uh, billions of years ago. So we learn a lot about the universe, not just um, its age, from the Hubble telescope. And what we get from it is the modern version of Hubble's law. I have to use that word, hate it. Um, and this is, uh, this is now giving a number 68 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And it's just kilometers per second makes people... Is he saying law? Because that's true. This sure as hell ain't no law. Or is he saying Hubble's because he wants it to be Hubble the Matria? And so he put these quotes here. See, this is more accurate redshift, but notice they just parentheses velocity. Like, what the fuck? No. <laughs> it is redshift distance. Redshift distance redshift per distance not velocity translation interpretation people think it's a velocity it's not it's got the units of velocity but it's the way space is expanding and what it means so as he's saying people think it's velocity but it's not it's got the units of velocity but its space is expanding. <laughs> Why does it have the units of velocity? Because we're just making this shit up because we're interpreting it through the lens of Doppler shift. That's why. Through the lens that motion is causing this redshift. And then what is that motion? We'll just literally make it up and it, it is expansion of space. No. It is redshift per distance, period.
what that redshift is caused by not expansion of space <laughs> oh my god i gotta go back and listen to that though because i cut it in half 68 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And if this kilometers per second makes people think it's a velocity, it's not. It's not the units of velocity, but it's the way space is expanding. And what it means is that an object that is 68, that is one megaparsec away, which is just over 3 million light years, is receding because space is expanding at 68 kilometers a second, as if it's moving through space. But what I love about this is, this bit up here, if I can press the right button, whoops, no, I can't, I'm useless. Okay, this, this patch, which looks odd, called the Virgo cluster. The Virgo cluster is a, a large, cluster of galaxies, a lot of galaxies that are held together by gravity, like a swarm of bees, it's a usual analogy, but they're moving around relative to each other. So some are moving towards us and some are moving away from us, and the whole cluster is moving because the universe is expanding in what's sometimes called the Hubble flow. So that apparent scattering there that looks like errors is a measure of how the Doppler effect is influencing the cosmological effect. So you see that, that there is a lot of, of, of Doppler effect as well as cosmological effect, and that highlights um, that the, the redshift is not a Doppler effect. So this is a good number, this 68, is a culmination. It's, it's the number that we get from the Hubble telescope, um, the, the, the key project, and on its own would justify the existence of the Hubble telescope and all the pretty pictures and other things are just a bonus in the eyes of the people who designed it. So that's as far as conventional observations can take us. So what, what about the theory? What was the beginning like? What was the Big Bang? This is what Lemaitre is saying in the mid-1940s, that you go back and back in time, you get to a beginning. And the beginning was some kind of very hot, dense state, uh, and it was a team of American researchers who are pictured here, and if you can't see the names on there, um, there's Robert Herman on the left and Ralph Alpha on the right, and George Gamow, who I mentioned in the middle. Uh, Gamow, by then, was, was, was in the States, and the other two guys were his PhD students, and he was very interested in the ideas that Lemaitre promoted, and they were interested in what had come out of the beginning of the universe. And Gamow wanted to make all the elements out of hydrogen by sticking things together to make helium, and then sticking helium nuclei to make carbon and so on up the chain. Uh, and he set these guys the task of working out what conditions were like, and they worked out that in order to make anything at all, fairly obviously, it had to be hot. And then the centre of the sun has to be hot enough to make uh, hydrogen fuse to make helium. So they uh, calculated that there must have been, as Hoyle put it, a big bang, in which the universe, the early universe, was very hot and very dense. And they put some numbers in, uh, and they worked out that the temperature must have been a few degrees absolute, a few K, about minus 270 uh, on, on the Celsius scale. Gamow didn't do this. He, he was a supervisor, but he loved the idea and he promoted it very vigorously, but he didn't, he didn't think of it. I mean, you often see accounts which say that he invented it and he did the calculations. He didn't. He was absolutely dreadful at arithmetic and whenever he did do the calculation, he got it wrong. So these guys deserve all the credit, Alf, Alpha and Herman. Um, and this is Gamow who, who got all the credit and was actually a fascinating person uh, who, who did lots of stuff, including stars and cosmology and he contributed to uh, cracking the genetic code and all kinds of things. But he deserves the credit for promoting the idea but uh, he didn't promote it vigorously enough because it was forgotten. Uh, and after the early 1950s, hardly anybody remembered the idea, except Yamov, who would occasionally sort of bend people's ear and tell them about it. And Alpha and Herman went off to do other work, and so they didn't promote it either. Uh, and nobody remembered it, nobody significant remembered it, until the mid-1960s. And then these guys, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, they discovered, using the telescope you see behind them, a weak hiss of radio noise coming from all directions in space it became known as the cosmic microwave background radiation because it's at microwave frequencies. And I should say that they were much younger then. This picture was taken later when they got some award or other. They went back to have it taken at the telescope. They didn't have a clue what they'd found. Famously, they thought it was a fault with a telescope. They cleaned it out. They cleaned pigeon droppings out of it. They covered all the rivets with aluminium foil so that it would be smooth. They, they kept... He's telling the same, the same story. They didn't have a clue... What they found, they went through this process. Every time you hear about this, you'll hear about how they cleaned the telescope, looked to make sure there wasn't bird droppings, and blah, blah, blah. And then one day, some people showed up and were like, you guys found the remnants of the Big Bang. Uh, what? Why? Well, because we said so. Big Bang happened, so there must be some kind of remnants, and you found it. We're going to go ahead and just literally take this observation as if it is what we want it to be. And then claim that it is here on 4th, and there we go. We've got more proof that the Big Bang happened, because here it is. It, let's look at, say, Earth. Earth has an atmosphere. Um, that atmosphere it seems, you know, like 
if I move my hand, it's pretty, it's pretty similar temperature here. Now let's say that in one position here is Earth, and then its observable universe is within this range, then is it going to have a similar background temperature? Probably. To some degree, maybe one measurable. Is it even coming from the background? Are we sure the distance of this has some kind of remnants in the distance? Are we sure it's not just some underlying thing that's throughout all around us? Why is this? There's so many questions that are just ignored because we just wanted to take the cosmic microwave background as proof that the Big Bang happened, as if it's some physical piece of evidence that it happened. Like Here's physical proof that the Big Bang happened. See, there was an explosion. But... Uh, <laughs> finding this signal coming from all directions in space it's but you just, know what it was it just frustrates me like hearing this story over and over and over again and making it like they always build it up like oh blah 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 it's just <laughs> it's like a selling selling tactic and to me the reason this is this is story that's heard all the time is because they were sold on the same story. Oh wow, they did they tried to clean the pigeon droppings. That didn't work. And then and then they found out it was the remnants of the big bang. Damn, that's crazy. <laughs> Um, but just down the road at, at Princeton University, there was a team uh, who also didn't know about the work of Alpha and Herman, and they had independently come up with exactly the same idea, and they were predicting that the universe should have a background with a temperature of a few degrees K. And long story, but the two teams eventually got together and, and found that that was exactly what had been being measured. So this was the moment, really, when the Big Bang Theory was sort of came in from the cold, if you like. In the mid-1960s, people had found the background radiation that had actually been predicted you know, nearly 20 years earlier, uh, although it had been forgotten. So... What you find is, uh, you, you hope, is a black body curve. Remember the radiation from the sun, the black body. Now, that's what the theory says you ought to get if the universe is producing this hiss of radiation, which is a, 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 a black body radiation, which is what it ought to be if uh, Alpha and Herman and all the other people are correct. So, remember, that's a typical, that's a good plot in astronomy in those days. You know, this, this, is, this is excellent, you know, and this much scatter, you know, you think, ah, no, wouldn't worry about that. You know, this is obviously a, a really decent straight line, okay? So, in order to follow up, as the technology improved, uh, a satellite was put up at the end of the... I don't know if I've ever heard anyone discuss, like, is this something that could exist in some other environment? Is this 100% must be a, only a, in a Big Bang? Are there some other circumstances that could produce such an observation? Like, in terms of analyzing the Big Bang critically rather than just blindly claiming it to be so. I've never heard of a story of like a debate around this, of whether or not this had a proper interpretation of what it was. I mean, if we see something and we happen to have an interpretation, that doesn't mean that that interpretation is the correct one. Are we not going to think about it? Oh, we already have some expectation here, so that's what's going on. Since I had this expectation, maybe that's it. That's it. There's no other possible way that any other thing could be going on here because we already figured it out beforehand. So why would we think about it when we already thought about it? The 1980s, it's called Kobe, Cosmic Microwave Background Explorer. And Kobe looked at the sky from above the Earth's atmosphere, and it measured the, the radiation, and it found that. And in case you can't see it, the little blobs on there are 1% error bars. Mm. The curve is a perfect black body, and if you read the small print, it says this is nine minutes of data. 
So you put a satellite up, and in nine minutes, you have measured the temperature of the universe to better precision than ever before, and you've proved that it is indeed uh, black body radiation. Um, people got Nobel Prizes for that, hardly surprisingly. People got very excited and said, oh, we need better satellites now. So NASA put this one up. Um, it's called WMAP. And a little bit later, the European Space Agency put this one up. NASA's was quicker, not quite so accurate. ESA took a bit longer and measured it even more accurately, so there's really very little difference between them, but Planck is slightly more precise. So it's Planck data that I shall mention from now on. And Planck could measure not just the overall average temperature of the sky, those Kobe ones, 1% errors. This is an actual map of the temperature differences from place to place on the sky. And it's the whole sky. You imagine, you, know, you see a, a map of the Earth sometimes spread out to make this kind of oval pattern, and that's the sphere of the Earth unwrapped. Well, this is the same thing on the sky, round from the inside, unwrapped and laid out. So that's the whole sky. And the temperature differences are colour-coded arbitrarily, um, just to make them stand out. But the important thing is that the temperature differences that Planck can measure are as small as a millionth of a degree. So you've got temperature, which is on average 2.7 degrees on the absolute scale, and you're measuring differences from place to place of a millionth of a degree. And this pattern tells you how the temperature of the universe varied from place to place at a time when the radiation was released. And that was roughly, I'll explain why in the book, I haven't got time now, roughly 300,000 years after what we call the Big Bang. And it was at that time that the universe cooled to about the temperature of the surface of the sun today. And that's the point. This is why it's the surface of the sun, the same reason. At that point, um, nuclei of atoms, things like protons, can join together with electrons and make electrically neutral atoms. And once the universe is electrically neutral, the radiation can stream up. Don't even know what electrically neutral is. What is a charge? Science says that charges are just things. That's just how it is. Why are they? Why? Why are they charged? Uh, cause they're charges. <laughs> like, no, that's not an answer. To even think that this process is happening is to assume that there is such a thing as a charge. When it's not some fundamental of nature, but it's a emergent phenomenon that we observe as charge, which is a difference. <sighs> so many flaws. Along without being affected. But just before it was released, it was interacting with the matter. So this is also a map of the distribution of matter across the universe when it was 300,000 years old, and everywhere was the temperature of the surface of the sun today. Now, I would need another hour to explain exactly why, but if you compare the pattern of the distribution of matter then and the pattern now by looking at the way galaxies, millions and millions of galaxies are spread across the universe, you see big patterns. And you can work out how long it's taken to get from there to here. Uh, essentially, you start with a small thing and gravity pulls things together, um, then the longer it takes, the bigger things get. Um, but the important thing is that this gives you a completely separate way, nothing to do with Cepheid variables or the Hubble telescope or anything like that, of measuring uh, the Hubble parameter, uh, the Hubble constant, whatever you want to call it, and thereby working out the age of the universe. Okay? So this is how good the observations are. Uh, and this is a, what's called a power spectrum. And th these wiggles, these are temperature fluctuations, and this is the size of the different patches of the sky that you look at. So this is actually telling you how different sized, how, how common different sized regions are across the sky. Um, and again, you know, there's, there's, there's down here there's a bit of uncertainty. But at least you, you can hardly see the uncertainty in the measurements compared with the, the theoretical line. So this is how well we understand the universe today. And the theoretical line in this case comes from what's called the standard arc model. Again, whole, whole other talk about that. But that is something that you've probably heard about, which involves uh, three things. It involves uh, the, the kind of matter that we are made of, atoms and so on, uh, the kind of things stars and galaxies are made of, sometimes called baryonic matter. It involves something else called dark matter, which we know is there because we can see the way galaxies move, that there's something holding them together by gravity and holding clusters of galaxies together. That's called dark matter. And then there's the other thing which has um, been in the news over the past few years, which is dark energy, which is a kind of springiness of space, which is pushing the universe to expand faster. Uh, and because of Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared, dark energy is also mass uh, and affects the way things like clusters of galaxies develop in the expanding universe. And the shorthand term for uh, dark energy is lambda, it's like the Greek letter lambda. So this standard model is called lambda CDM, uh, lambda cold dark matter, and uh, everyday matter being taken for granted. And to put our place in the universe in another perspective, very roughly, don't quote these figures exactly, the amount of baryonic matter, what we're made of in the universe, is about 4% of the total density. And the amount of dark matter is about 24, 25%, so we're, we're insignificant compared even with dark matter. And the amount of dark energy is about 70, 72%. So most of the mass of the universe is actually this mysterious dark energy, which is a huge project now going on to try and understand it and find out what it is and how it's a 
all of which comes from interpreting the redshift per distance as being linear, finding out that it's not linear, and that instead it's exponential. And so why is it exponential? Well, space is expanding, which is what the linear interpretation of redshift per distance correlation means, according to the interpretations. And so because space is, is expanding, it must be expanding faster over larger distances. So something is causing space to expand faster over larger distances because we know that the expansion of space itself is linear. So there's some other thing causing expansion of space to accelerate. And that, it will just, we don't know what it is, but we can name it. We'll call it dark energy. And uh, fuck it, because we know that energy equals mc squared, well, it, therefore, dark energy is also mass, and apparently. Um, and, uh, you know, it's 72% of the universe. Uh, we know that you don't have any experience in your life with it, but, you know, it makes up 72%. Because we figured it out by the way the line that we thought was a line is actually exponential and because of how exponential it is that means well there's there must be a lot of dark energy that's that's what that means or maybe it means our entire model's fucked i don't know that can't be it because we know what we're talking about affecting the expansion of the universe. And there are other huge projects that have been going on for some time to try and find dark matter uh, and looking for it in interesting places like at the bottom of gold mines and under the mountains between Switzerland and Italy and so on. Um, but they're not what I'm particularly concerned about here. Uh, what I'm concerned about is the age of the universe. So this is the bottom line uh, of what comes out of the observations with satellites. And it is really, really, really good. You know, look, look at how tiny. This is the 13.799 plus or minus 0.02. The uncertainty is in this bit, okay? It's less than 2%. Okay, we know the age of the universe in, in the sense of being the time since the Big Bang to an accuracy of better than 2%. You know, imagine what somebody like Hubble or Sandage even would have thought of that. And that's one of the most profound and significant and amazing things in the whole of science, and it deserves even more publicity whoa, than whoa, it gets. Whoa, whoa. What is he saying when it's one of the most profound things? Oh my god. My mind is blown. That is so profound that the universe is finite in age. I would have thought it, it was eternal, but you know, or maybe 6,000 years, you know, because that's what the Bible apparently said. But, you know, fuck eternal. Eternal is so long. It takes forever for eternity to pass. Could you imagine having to wait for eternity? I'd rather wait 13.8 billion years. That's a nice little time frame there, you know? It comes, it goes. Just like the universe comes, goes. You know, it's just a blip in the night and then we're gone. Never to exist again, I guess, because that's what we figured out. We, that's just how it is. The universe is expanding into nothingness. Maybe it'll come back into a big crunch, you know, come back together. I don't know why, but fuck it, why not? <laughs> oh my god. It's, that's profound. 13.8 billion years. I mean, seriously, love, 13.8 billion. They, they think of this term billion as if it's some, like, huge number. I mean, all things are relative, though. I mean, one is a big number, two, if all I think of is in terms of 10 to the minus 100. I'm like, whoa, one? That must be really long. Because 10 to the minus 100th of that is really little. <laughs> like, what is, like, this is nothing. Literally nothing. There's 
trillions of atoms in like the, the, the tiniest of space and yet billions of years whoa that's mind-blowing dude <clears throat> this is not profound profound in some ways you know profound in it in what it demonstrates about how flawed our logic is at this time in history uh, profound that this is the widely accepted science in the world <laughs> in terms of what it demonstrates about us about our way of thinking or not thinking I don't know but even better <clears throat> we've used quantum physics to tell us how old stars are mm. We've used the general theory of relativity, in essence, oh to tell us how old the universe God. is. And it turns out that the universe is just a little bit older than the stars. So it's quite obvious that the stars formed Physics after the universe, works. after the Big Bang. And it. that tells us that whether or not we've got do a theory do of everything do which do combines do quantum do physics do and relativity theory. Do do do. This tells us whether or not we've got a theory of everything composed of five theories. You know, I have a, th I have a theory of everything. It has 72 theories, that which I have merged into... Uh, separate and distinct parts that are not overlapping but explain different segments of all things. Um, one explains the function of a toad swimming through the water. Another is about uh, uh, I forgot. I forgot. Don't worry about that one. Because there's 70 other theories that I also have to apply to my theory of everything. So luckily, <laughs> because we have merged these theories into distinctly separate components that are not merged, we've done it. We figured it out. We know that they're both telling us something accurate and true and profound about the whole scientific enterprise. You know, we're doing something right, or these numbers wouldn't... Let me adjust that. Telling us something approximately accurate, maybe. And the word approximate is, you know, relative. Um, next to thousand years ago, maybe it's accurate and true approximately. But next to the future, it will be essentially the opposite uh, in terms of being approximately false. And then over time, it'll just come to be just false. You know, it'll just transform. It'll be like a evolution of the current theories. You know, we'll see, we'll see evolution occur in nature and just watch it as... The theories go from being uh, true to approximately true to fault, um, somewhat true down to the neutrally true. I don't know. I don't know what the stage is. We'll have to watch and see, I guess. <laughs> agree. So that is really hugely, hugely important, you know, in, in terms of... of any understanding of, of what we're doing and what science is about. And I get, I used to get letters in green ink, but now I get emails in block capitals. And people say, ah, you know, Einstein must be wrong because, you know, and, and they sort of pull out one bit of Einstein and come up with some other theory. And those kinds of people do not understand. Mm -hmm. You can't do that with science. You can't pick and choose. You know, it's all or nothing. Yeah, there might be a theory. They are literally doing that with the Big Bang, with everything you just talked about. Oh, there's this observation of redshift. So let's just throw out all the all the things we know in the past and make an entirely new theory. Because uh, what happened to Newton? What happened to all the the past things? It's literally what he's saying is what the models that he's claiming to be true did in the first place. And that's not how it works. You can't just do it and then be like, you can't do the same. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're picking and choosing. We've got, we got all these observations to back what we're saying. We're not picking and choosing. We, we're scientists here. You're not scientists. You don't understand. 
You don't understand. You're not a scientist. I devoted my life to this. I went to school for this. I paid lots of money. I listened and listened and learned and was I was not indoctrinated. Don't call me that. No, sir. Somebody might develop which will be better than the general theory, but it will be better in the same sense that the general theory is better than Newton's theory. It will tell us everything better that the general theory Newton's does. Because we know that no shit about fuck, bro. No offense. Hugs. General theory is right, and it will tell us something new as well. It may tell us something about you know, what happens in the far reaches of the universe. It may tell us that gravity was different long ago or something like that. But it cannot contradict the general theory because we've tested it, and tested it, and we know it's right. And the same with quantum physics. Right. There's a big cannot, puzzle. Cannot contradict. If, you, if anything goes against what we're saying, no, you're wrong. Wrong. We know it's right. We already know it's right. So what are you doing? Why, why are we having this conversation when we already figured it out? Listen. You go back to what? What is it you do? I don't care. Actually, I'm the scientist here. I don't care. Don't care. Don't. 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 Okay. We're gonna go ahead and keep believing what we're gonna believe, and we don't need to explain ourselves because we already did in our own minds, and uh, that's that. Sooner or later, you'll figure out we're right because we know we're right because we're scientists. That's just how science works. Science is a pursuit of knowledge, a study in way of learning. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about, but... Okay, let me finish this. This video is long enough. People worry. A few people. Most quantum physicists don't care. They, the, the expression is shut up and calculate. No, when you've got the equations that work, don't worry about why they work. Just do the numbers. Few people do care, and they worry about... Fuck it. Just shut up and calculate. Look, are you not calculating? Shut up and calculate. That's actually an expression that they have because they don't uh, like it when you're thinking. What are you doing? What are you, are you thinking again? Dude, stop thinking. Just do. Just do, brah. We got we got the answers. We just need a little fine tuning within the answers. You know what I'm saying? There's little details that need worked out. Just little ones. Just tiny they're they're minute really. So you don't need to think. What you need to do is calculate. So shut the fuck up. Stop thinking and calculate. The foundations of quantum physics, as they put it, what is it all about? You know, why do we have things like uncertainty? How does why a photon on that side of the universe like know what a photon on the other side of the universe is doing? There may be something beyond quantum physics. How could it be that the universe would make no sense? It's almost as if we're the ones who make no sense. Hmm. What was I just thinking? Um, I think I was dreaming, dude. I'm going to get back to calculating. In that sense, but again, it will tell us the same things that quantum physics does about all the things that quantum physics has already told us. We know it's right, and we know, we know they're both right, right because of this. So right. I think that's, you know, having told you that physics is right, I, um, I should stop there and maybe take some questions if you've got any. Told you. Did you, did you. did you hear me when I told you that physics is right? Did you catch how I named this the search for the theory of everything and then claim throughout the video how we've already found it with several different theories that are not the theory? I mean, the theory is one theory. It is not a sp an arc of theories that are literally unrelated to each other. <laughs> oh my god. I mean, this is like... Uh, Greek gods or something, you know, where they have like 17 gods all that do different things. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's how it is, guys. There's just all these gods. Each one's god of this, god of that. And that's how they do it. That's how the universe functions. You know? Big Bang God. I wonder who the Big Bang God would be. What would they call that? quantum mechanics god would probably be some uh the, 
something quirk related maybe i don't know quirk sidon maybe and then uh big bang hmm. expansimos maybe that one and then relativity the god of relativity would be uh And let's just let it be Einstein. He's he's pretty much a god in science. Oh, the Einstein gave us derp a derp a derp. <laughs> uh, we're still learning from Einstein. I heard that today in something I was listening to. Einstein is still teaching us. Like, dude, you guys need to relax. <laughs> I mean, Einstein's awesome at all, but goddamn, <laughs> it's like almost a competition to love Einstein mo the most. Do you see how much I understand? Don't you see my love for Einstein? That shows me that I understand him. That what he says it makes sense to me. Do you know what that tells you about me? Is I'm, I'm quite the intelligent person. I don't want to brag. I don't want to brag. <laughs> like that's kind of what it is. That's my interpretation. You know, the more we talk about Einstein, you know, Einstein this, Einstein that, and blah blah blah, the more it suggests that some people are just trying to uh, look a certain way. Anyway, uh, I'm going to stop recording this. Uh, this video was as perhaps ridiculous as I expected going into it. Once I started listening to him, I was like, oh, damn, here we go again. <laughs> uh, sigh. Nothing against this guy. I mean, it was a good talk, good presentation. Um just a lot of the same assumptions and just like missing pieces of the puzzle there's so much going on that is just completely disregarded steps that are just taken for granted as a, as if they're factual when there's so much more detail to it there's nuances surrounded by nuances that are just like taken as single points of fact and nothing more. But thanks for uh, checking out the video. Sorry I'm ranting. This is long as fuck. <laughs> I'll be around. Feel free to subscribe. Uh, leave a like, you know. Mucho gracias. Peace out.